Chris Powell. I'm recording presentation three for Harvey, Miriam, <clears throat> and the group is for responsive adaptive randomization. And I'm going to be addressing the questions uh, posed to by the majority of students um, already in the first two presentations. Alright, so uh, from presentation one, Paul Dean asked, what is the definition of a failure as discussed in Sharvey's presentation from slide 13? And the answer is, uh, from the example in slide 13, uh, which is next, what we're referring to is uh, the expected number of failures. So his question was, what does a failure refer to? And for example, let's use HIV diagnosis and the drug AZT. For example, Charlie was referring to treatment failures. So a patient with HIV in the study who doesn't respond to AZT, AZT would be a treatment failure. And at a fixed sample size of 1400 and a fixed power of approximately 80%, plot is showing the probability to detect an absolute difference of 7% of the treatment failures. So this would be the non-response uh, measuring the non-response to treatment with AZT, for example, between the two treatment arms of treatment arm A and treatment arm B at a significant level, significant level of alpha 0 0.05. So we can see here um, that this is conditional on the fixed sample size of 1400, and this line is conditional on a fixed power of 83%, and you can see that it meets up here so the treatment allocation ratio is uh, approximately here to here shape it shared between both groups okay so that's uh, 0.32 and 0.25 great question so the exact definition of treatment failure will depend on the parameter set during clinical testing of a drug and this example just shows a generalization of the RAR procedure. So uh, definition review, um, responsive adaptive randomization is a randomization procedure that uses outcome of the study with the objective to maximize the power and minimize expected treatment failures. So this is the overall view and you can see here this is the treatment effect uh, here. So treatment effect and or treatment failures would be not responding to the drug. And so Paul's second question. Uh, so with uh, RAR, we get the problem that with lower sample size on the bad outcome, we get more uncertainty and on the rate of probability, rate or probability of those treatment levels. That makes the ratio also more uncertain. So where is the trade-off? When I should stay with fixed allocation designs versus using RAR? And Paul, you got me. This is a great question because there is no easy answer. Uh, many different things need to be considered in order to answer this question for a biostatistician and investigators alike. And I think the following slide sums it up best. So according to um, Fai Fang Hu and William F. Rosenberger, one major factor in deciding this is the assessment of the expected number of treatment failures. But the decision should be calibrated based on the outcomes of a clinical trial. So for example, only a moderate reduction in treatment failures may be critically important when the outcome of the trial is grave. For example, high death rates. Uh, for example, let's say the study was studying uh, the outcome was uh, how many people get Ebola virus or how many people get COVID-19. That's a critically uh, important outcome because the trial is grave. But while in other trials, the outcome of the trial might not be as grave. For example, let's say the outcome is 
uh, acne development. So therefore the outcome of the trial is not so grave as death or uh, severe morbidity disease. So uh, the following figure may still be a good guide then, Paul, when you uh, are trying to answer this question. So uh, this was from Sharvey's uh, and Marion's presentation uh, earlier. And this is um, trying to find the perfect balance between ethics and efficiency of statistics. So um, you need to decide where, where this all comes down for your particular trial. All right, so next we have a more uh, technical theory question from Chi Tang. Could you explain the equation behind uh, responsive adaptive randomization? What does each variable in the equation mean? So this is a complicated, uh, complicated question. So this is how I tried to answer it. So if we're going to consider a clinical trial of n patients, each of whom will randomly receive one of k treatments. A uh, randomization procedure is defined by the following equation. Uh, whoops. Excuse me. Uh, a randomization sequence is a matrix of t, t equals to t1 down to t to the n, where t i, t to the i equals e to the j, where j equals 1, and uh, k, where i equals 1, down to n and e, j is a vector of zeros with a 1 in the jth position. So we'll be interested in exploring properties of the randomization sequence, which will involve uh, in deriving the asymptomatic properties of the allocation proportions given by large n, small sample n, over small n, where large n times uh, small n equals, in parentheses, uh, large n1, parentheses, small n, to uh, large n to the k, parentheses, small n, and n, large n, uh, small j, nj uh, to uh, the small n equals the sum of n i equals 1 times the matrix of t to the ij. And uh, it necessarily means that the absolute value of large n uh, to the small times small n equals the sum of k j equals 1 times large n to the j times n, small n, excuse me, equals n. So now, let x equals x equals 1, excuse me, x equals x1 down to x to the n number of uh, where x e xi equals xij to the xik be a matrix of response variables where xi represents the sequence of responses that would be observed if each treatment were assigned to the ith patient independently and only one element of xi will be observable. So now let's consider that the probability models for xi will be conditional on the matrix of ti and zi where t represents the matrix from the randomization sequence and z represents a vector of covariates that we are interested in. And so let's let tn equals uh, sigma t1 to tn be the sigma algebra generated by the first n treatment assignments. Let x to the n equals sigma be the sig sigma algebra excuse me, generated by the first n responses and let z to the n equals sigma z1 down to zn be the sigma algebra generated by the first n covariate layers, excuse me, vectors. Let, now let fn from the equation equal tn times xn times xn, excuse me, times cn plus 1. 
So a randomization procedure is defined by the equation, and this is what I had uh, pasted in the previous slide. Uh, theta, excuse me, phi n equals um, e parentheses t to the n uh, on the other side, the function of n minus 1, and we can describe phi n as the conditional probability of assigning treatments 1 down to the k to the nth patient, conditional on the previous n minus 1 assignments, responses, and covariate vectors, and the current patient's covariate vector. Now, that was just a brief rundown and um, a little choppy of the theory behind the RER equation. So for more an extensive uh, breakdown of the theory behind the equation that I presented, or if you'd like to explore more complicated procedures of RAR, and those were some of the other uh, student questions as well. Two examples of two examples are um, V's or Y's urn, or Efron's based coin design, biased coin design. Excuse me. Please refer to the following textbook that I utilized, which is. Uh, Faith King Hugh, William F. Rosenberger, The Theory of Response, Adaptive Randomization in Clinical Trials, which is Wiley Series on Probability and Statistics, Year 2006, by Wiley Interscience uh, Incorporated. Copyright. So, Chi Tang's second question Since adaptive randomization makes the two groups no longer independent from each other, how do you take that into account during statistical analysis, analysis later on? And um, as you have seen, this great question was answered in the earlier parts of the third presentation that you have now seen. Sharvey and Miriam showed uh, that the R package block RAR must be used in order to take such factors into account. So for Gerard Jarvin, his question was, one of his questions was, when playing the winner method is used, does allocation percent change if percent responding to treatment of interest is greater than the other treatment, or does it need to be better by a certain percentage threshold? So for quick play the winner uh, method review, go back to those previous slides and we look at how this is chosen. Uh, the patients are allocated. If the first patient's response to their given treatment is a success, then the next patient, M0 plus 1, is designed assigned to the same treatment group as given to n0. And if the first patient's response to their given treatment is a failure, then the next patient, n0 plus 1, is assigned to the other treatment. So that's simple, does it? That's the play the winner method in review. Because under this method, allocation is not determined by any percentages or any percentage thresholds. And using play the winner, there is no percentage threshold. Allocation is only uh, determined by the winner rule described on the previous slide. So for his second question, Gerard Garvin asked, why is it called a burning period? And this is a good question. So for a brief review uh, from previous presentations, the burning period is when subjects are enrolled into the study and randomized without using RAR, just so enough information uh, can be is acquired before an allocation probability can be determined for RAR. So the burn-in is a colloquial term also used in Markov chain Monte Carlo MS, MCMC that describes one method of finding a good starting point. And the term burn-in comes from electronics. Many components are known to fail quickly, so a burn-in is done at the factory to eliminate the worst ones. Therefore, burn-in is just one method of selecting a startup distribution, and that's where the term originates from. So the source there is users.stat.umn.edu if you want to check it out. So simulate your years for his question on slide 6 in uh, presentation 1, figure 1, slide 6. How many subjects are using the initial round? to get a baseline response so that future subjects can be assigned. The figure seems to imply that one patient is assigned per treatment arm. So figure one here from slide six from presentation uh, one, 
and um, that I think was just an overview of the RAR process and you probably noticed that subject how subjects are allocated was described later in presentation one and in further detail in presentation two for example play the winner rule and the minimization method of Pocock and Simon and then in this presentation I mentioned uh, Efron's bias coins and coin design and V's urn that um, I know Sharvi uh, went through uh, an urn and a block design as well. So uh, you can refer to the textbook or to the previous presentations for that. And I hope I properly answered that question, Samia. For her second question, um, could you please explain and meant what, again what is meant by Pmax and Pn in the interim monitoring slide from my section? And this question uh, was asked uh, actually due to a typo on my part, and I apologize. For more review, I have copied the My Interim Monitoring slide from the next frame, for the next frame, for the next present, from the previous presentation. So here's that slide that I'm talking about. And here, this is the typo. It should have been P M I N P min greater than 99%. So that's the typo, and it should have read uh, probability of uh, minimum amount of success. So therefore, the trial is stopped based on whether either each of the fall either of the following values uh, being obtained at an interim analysis is found. So on this slide, it was supposed to be p max greater than five percent and p min less than nine percent. Excuse me, p min less than ninety nine percent. So. So interim monitoring plans are instituted to potentially stop the clinical trial early for safety or efficacy reasons. And Pmax refers to the maximum probability of success. So if it is less than 5%, the trial will be stopped due to futility. And Pmin refers to the minimum probability of success. So if it is greater than or equal to 99%, the trial will be stopped due to success. And again, I apologize for the typo. So Daniel Stone, question one and two. Um, by now, both questions have likely been answered in subsequent presentations. And his first question was regarding using R for analysis, which has been an earlier part of this presentation, regarding the R package uh, block, RAR, which was used to conduct the analysis. And um, so, uh, his second question uh, was for the RA group, R group, therefore, stems from this confusion, but it's pretty general. What are some of the benefits and challenges that we'll need, we will need to address with each of the three kinds of adaptive methods? Are there assumptions that we need to be aware of, and would you be willing to provide examples of each method to help me understand them a bit better? So, both of those questions have been answered already in the subsequent uh, presentations uh, or this presentation. So I want to apologize to Vladislav, Dustin, and Vanessa. In, in the interest of time, I was only able to finish five of the students, eight, uh, five of the eight students, and keep in mind each student had two questions. So I'm already at 18 and a half minutes right now, so it would have taken up to 30 minutes. So. In the final presentation, I will try to answer your questions or distribute the questions among the three of our group members. And I want to thank everybody for some amazing questions. This is the end of the RER presentation for Sharvi, Miriam, and Chris.